Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains predictable. Seriously, I do the same thing every week. You know what this is about. And today, we are going to discuss terrible things, and this time it's planes again. These are five more of the worst planes ever. Part four. There's, there's a lot of bad planes, just like there's a lot of bad trains. I could do this forever. The Blackburn B-26 Balta. This four-seat reconnaissance and torpedo bomber was produced by the British aviation company Blackburn Aircraft, who admittedly have produced some decent planes, but for some reason, I feel like, especially during World War II, they really weren't that great at the job. Because if you saw the name Blackburn in front of any aircraft around that time, usually it was, at best, very questionable. And that was the case with the Botha. It first flew on the 28th of December, 1938, and it was introduced just the following year, 1939. It was developed during the mid-30s in response to the Air Ministry's specification M15-35, and it was ordered straight off the drawing board, which is always alarming whenever I hear anything British and off the drawing board. During the official evaluation testing, stability issues were revealed, as well as the fact that it was hideously underpowered. As it turned out, it really wasn't that good or anything. From a reconnaissance point of view, it was actually completely worthless, as the crew's view to the side or to the rear was basically non-existent due to the positioning of the engines. It could drop torpedoes and mines, but because of its poor performance overall, it was never really very good at that, and it was basically worthless if it was attacked by anything. By 1941, the air staff had had enough, and it was withdrawn from frontline service and used for secondary duties, mostly for training. But even at that, it wasn't very good. Some of them were actually converted to target tugs, which seemed about the only thing they were ever good for. As one test pilot put it, entry to the cockpit is difficult. It should be made impossible. The Tupolev Tu-144. Now wait a second. Isn't that the Concorde? Well, no. This is the Soviet version of the Concorde a supersonic passenger airliner that was designed by Tupolev that was in operation from 1968 to 1999. It actually beat the Concorde to its first flight, which took place on the 31st of December, 1968. That was two months before Concorde took off. Additionally, it was larger and faster, but that was about all it was good for. Because, frankly, they were pieces of junk. Soviets had rushed production in order to be the first in the world to have a supersonic airliner. The problem with that is that, well, there wasn't enough time taken to actually test the problems that it obviously was going to have? Early flights with it showed serious reliability issues during 102 flights and about 181 hours of freight and passenger flight time it suffered more than 226 failures, 80 of those were in flight. Due to these issues, many flights had to be cancelled or rescheduled, which definitely frustrated passengers. It was also found that the airframe was subject to fatigue cracking, which is never a good thing for any airplane, let alone one that would be subjected to supersonic forces. And they were loud, like really loud, like not just in the supersonic nature of the sonic booms and not being able to fly over regular cities because of the noise complaints. No, 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 no. I mean inside the cabin. The 144 could only sustain supersonic speeds by use of afterburners like a military aircraft. The Concorde didn't do that. As a result, the noise in the cabin was outrageous. And allegedly, those seated two seats apart could not actually hear each other even if they screamed and had to pass handwritten notes instead. It was ridiculous. And it never made sense from an economic point of view either. For the Soviet Union, well, they were communist. We know that. Everyone knows that. That's pretty common knowledge. And in a communist society, there aren't really any rich people. That's, uh, that's not how that's supposed to work. The Concorde only got away with what it did because it marketed itself as a high-class, high-priced, 
first-rate experience. Something for the ultra-wealthy, who could travel in comfort and at speed. The 144 could never be marketed that way. They literally weren't even allowed to charge extra for the tickets. So having something like this in a communist economy was not going to work. It couldn't even make enough money just to break even, let alone make a profit at all. Oh yeah, and one crash at the 1973 Paris Air Show, which was not a good look at all. The Curtis SO3C Seamew. Sometimes called the Sea Gull by the US Navy, but that was the name of the plane it was meant to replace, the SOC Sea Gull, which makes it really confusing. And the Royal Navy kept calling it the Sea Mew. I'm gonna stick with the Sea Mew just to avoid confusion. This thing first flew on the 6th of October, 1933, manufactured by the Curtis Wright Corporation, and it sucked. It was literally inferior to the plane it was supposed to replace. Mind you, the Seagull, if you haven't already noticed, was a biplane. This is a monoplane, a modern one, but it had a lot of issues early on and continued to have them. For one thing, other than the fact that they don't really look like the most attractive planes in the world, they had serious stability issues that were only partially solved, but the real issue was the engine. The engine was, quite frankly, the dumpster fire of an engine. It was a unique design, air-cooled and in an inverted V-shape. Also, it was an inline engine, not a radial engine that a lot of prop planes were finding far more useful. The CMU, no matter what they did to it, always seemed way more lethal for the pilots than for any enemy combatants. Mind you, its role was just to be a standard float plane scout launched off of a catapult. But the Royal Navy started calling them Sea Cows. Their standard fuel tank actually held 300 gallons, but they never took off with more than 80, because anything beyond that would be too heavy for them. The tail also had to be raised before they went airborne, because if it wasn't, it was possible to take off in an altitude from which it was both impossible to recover and in which there was no aileron control. Which sounds horrifying, actually. They were garbage, regardless of whether the US Navy or the Royal Navy was using them. They were declared obsolete in September of 1944 and finally removed from service in 1945 for the Royal Navy. The US Navy, towards the end of World War II, wound up replacing them with the very plane they were supposed to replace, the SOC Seagulls, because the Seagulls at least weren't killing their own pilots. The Royal Aircraft Factory BE-9. What kind of horror show are you showing to me now? Only one of this experimental aircraft was ever built, and it first flew on the 14th of August, 1915. It's based very, very closely on the BE-2C. The major difference being, um, that. That thing, right there. Okay, why is that there? And why is the prop behind it? I will answer this question. The idea of this experiment was to combine the high performance of a tractor configuration aircraft, which is just a conventional prop plane, one with the prop in the front, as opposed to a pusher, which has the prop behind, with a good field of fire for the observer's machine gun. Now, that's not unreasonable. You want to make sure the observer can see where they're shooting and the prop can get in the way of that, I understand. Yep, yep, yep. So their solution was to add a literal tiny wooden box right in front of the aircraft's propeller, which was eventually nicknamed the pulpit, presumably because the occupier would be praying to God constantly as they would be consistently reminded that they could die at any moment. The gunner would be armed with a Lewis gun on a trainable mount. But this was an awful, awful, horrifically dangerous idea. The pilot was probably fine, but the person in the gunner's seat was at risk of so many things, even in the mildest of crashes they could easily be crushed by the giant engine immediately behind them. Also, and this is probably relevant, what if a piece of clothing, or their hand, or anything, gets caught in the deadly whirling blades? What if that happens? Tell me, tell me. Tell me, what if that happens? I think you know how that's going to work, and it wouldn't go very well. The only prototype was actually sent for field testing, but the opinions that surrounded it were generally negative. From a performance perspective, technically it really wasn't that much different from the BE-2C, which had been fine, but the overwhelming danger factor for the gunner was just too much of a risk. No one wanted to be in that box, ever, under any circumstances. They were going to die. I should be thankful that, due to this, it never actually entered full production. 
as it was also partially rendered irrelevant due to the invention of synchronization gears. This device enabled single-engine tractor configuration aircraft to fire armament through the arc of the spinning propeller without bullets hitting the blades. Therefore, there was really no need to mount a random person in front of said blades. The Caproni CA-60. <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, no. I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh. I should not laugh because it was 1921. And there was still a lot people were learning about what worked when it came to airplanes. Particularly airliners. The idea of passenger airplanes, large-scale passenger airplanes, was very much in its infancy. And Gianni Caproni was an Italian aviation pioneer who was instrumental when it came to developing the Italian aviation industry. So I don't want to come down too hard on him because he was coming from a good place here, but um, this was never going to work. This was never, ever going to work. But believe it or not, it did fly. I don't know how, but it did. There's a lot of problems with this idea because his thought was that he actually wanted this to be a transatlantic airliner. Why would he put nine wings on it then? Well, it had eight engines, which sounds like a lot because it is, but his thought was actually that if one of the engines failed, there would still be enough to keep the aircraft airborne as a safety feature. And to be fair, in the modern day airliner scene, well, yeah, if they lose one, the other one is powerful enough to keep them going. That's a normal design idea. So Caproni was on the right track, just not with this. This was not going to work. He thought a flying boat configuration would make it easier for them to, you know, land in pretty much any situation. And he thought the aircraft could land in the middle of the Atlantic and refuel, thus allowing it to traverse the entire ocean. That was probably not going to work that well, because a flying boat requires calm seas to land safely. And the ocean does whatever it wants. You couldn't guarantee the ocean was going to be calm. So if this thing needed to land, possibly more than once, to get across the ocean? Uh, yeah, that, um, that could be an issue. There were two test flights regarding this thing. And the first one, yeah, it did fly, briefly. The aircraft was apparently very stable in the air, according to the pilot. And the controls were, believe it or not, responsive, which I still have trouble believing, but that's apparently how it went. The second flight test did not go quite as well, and according to the test pilot, he accelerated the aircraft to about 100 kilometers an hour and pulled the yoke toward himself. But suddenly, it took off and started climbing at a sharp nose-up altitude. Way, way too much. He reduced throttle to try to fix that, but then the aircraft's tail started falling. It hit the water tail first, and the whole thing broke apart. Fortunately, he and the flight engineers survived. There were two causes looked into when it came to what happened. It was believed that, for one thing, the wake of a steamboat that was navigating on the lake nearby was thought to have interfered with the takeoff. Secondly, the test pilot may have pulled the yoke too much when he should have performed corrective maneuvers instead. More recent theories say that perhaps the sandbags that had been put on board to simulate the weight of passengers weren't actually fastened, and they may have slid to the back of the fuselage when the aircraft took off and caused it to tip up way too sharply. But to be honest, the biggest issue has to do with the design itself. There's a reason we don't generally put wings on aircraft like this. The aerodynamics involved actually mess with the airflow over the following wings. It's still considered one of the most extraordinary aircraft ever built, due to how much went into the design, and several fragments are actually still around on display at several different museums. So, at least that's something. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131 232, Mr. Black Rose, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Tribal Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Ohio Trucker 1, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alan Rick Jaspers, Brian Pretzer, Twin Fox, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, and Ty Hammonds Jr. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.